The following podcast is taken from a live broadcast on Inspire FM. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Book Club Show on Inspire 105.1 FM. My name is Imrana Mahmood. I am delighted to be joined by um, a wonderful guest, um, Darek Hussein, and we will be discussing today his book, Minarets in the Mountains, A Journey into Muslim Europe. Um, so before I introduce um, Darek, what I will do is just give a quick um, a synopsis um, of um, the book itself to give you um, a flavour, really, of, of what this book is about. And actually, I, I absolutely loved it. Um, so here it is. A magical eye-opening account of a journey into Europe that rarely makes the news as and is in danger of being erased altogether. Another Europe. A Europe few people believe exists and many wish didn't. Muslim Europe. Londoner Darek Hussein sets off with his wife and young daughters around the Western Balkans, home to the largest indigenous Muslim population in Europe, and explores the regions of Eastern Europe where Islam has shaped places and people for more than half a millennium. Encountering blonde-haired, blue-eyed Muslims, visiting mystical Islamic lodges clinging to the side of mountains, and praying in mosques other than the Sistine Chapel, he paints a picture of a hidden Muslim Europe, a vibrant place with a breathtaking history, spellbinding culture and unique identity. Minarets in the Mountains, the first English travel narrative by a Muslim writer on this subject, also explores the historical roots of European Islamophobia. Tarek and his family learn lessons about themselves and their own identity as Britons, Europeans and Muslims. Um, and the synopsis goes on just to explain a bit more detail about what some of the co um, content that, that the book covers. Um, but I will now introduce um, to the listeners um, our wonderful guest, Tarek Hussain. So, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you so much for having me on, Imrana. Thank you so much for taking the time out. And I just want to say how much um, I just, you know, firstly, how much I enjoyed reading your book. Um, I think partly because uh, the fact that we've been in, you know, lockdown restrictions, not being able to travel like we maybe normally would. I think it was really nice to be transported to all these different places that actually I haven't had, I haven't had, the, you know, the, the privilege of, of visiting and learned just so, so much. Um, I guess my first question really is what inspired you to, to write this book, uh, Minarets in the Mountains? So um, some of your listeners may be aware that I've uh, much of my work um, up and including this book has been about traveling and trying to tell the other narratives and it, with, with obviously a special focus on, on Muslim heritage and Islamic heritage, particularly in the Western hemisphere, whether that's European, American, but I've also done work in places like um, Southern Thailand and the Middle East, where I've tried to tell those narratives that often get overlooked. But of course, this was a special project, a very personal project, because I'd been looking at the Islamic heritage of Europe and the Islamic narratives in Europe for nigh on two decades, you know, traveling, uh, making notes of them and, and realizing very, very and very, very early on, that Islam was here as soon as Islam was anywhere. In other words, you know, as early as the seventh century, we had people who were companions of the Prophet himself arriving in Cyprus. And we know this, this is this is recorded historically. And we've never really left since. Now, when I was exploring the Andalusian history, which many of us are very familiar with now, when I started looking into it, it was news to a lot of people, but now we're very familiar with it and, and, and people get very excited about it, rightly so, because, you know, there was so much exciting stuff going on that others just simply aren't aware of. And um, I, I always thought that might be the first book. And uh, um, but the, the, the thing is about that history, obviously, it's history. It's it's been and gone and it's often quite easy to dismiss. And um, and as we're a family who are traveling, you know, I, it's much more exciting to go and engage with something living. You know, I had two young girls. If all I did was drag them around old historic monuments and, and rocks that, that had a story, but they couldn't see it anymore, it's quite challenging. But no, in all seriousness, this was, this was the book that I needed to write. And the book, as Tim McIntosh Smith puts it, that I was meant to write, because this is the living legacy mm. of Islam 
from the seventh century. This is the this is the one that's continued right up until now. In that time, that baton, so to speak, has been passed on to several different mm. empires, if you will, and several several different types of Europeans, if you will, from the early um, Umayyad, um, you know, community. Um, right in, in in Andalusia, right up until now, we have um, you know the Bosniak, Albanian, Kosovan communities. Mm. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, and and I think it's you know I love what you're saying about the idea of, of living history because I think you're you're right that it's so easy just to kind of um, leave the idea of history in, in the past, and when we maybe perhaps do look at it or study it, it's kind of in a in a lens of of, of just perhaps just looking back rather than seeing the impact like you said and, and the legacy of it of it now um yeah. so definitely, definitely and i think it's also yeah. it's also important to make clear that you know this is this is the living legacy and therefore it's irrefutable you can't deny it's there you know you can't deny that it's a part of europe's religious and cultural landscape even mm -hmm. if that makes people very very uncomfortable and i know it does because i've i've been getting some very very horrible and awful messages via um, various social mediums where people are really unhappy that I'm telling them that there is a Muslim Europe. But, you know, it was never, it's not nothing new. I haven't introduced this. I haven't created something. I just went and saw it and told you about it. Um, and because I, I called it Muslim Europe, called it for what it is, you know, countries where the majority population, according to their own census and data, are Muslim, that's that's not something I'm making up. That's yeah. real, you know. And even if you don't like that, that is what it is. Exactly. And you know, obviously, I'm I'm so sad. I guess that you've obviously receiving those messages. Obviously, not not surprised. Um, but I mean, on that topic of of this idea that you know um, that even yeah, just relaying things as they are is kind of almost pure fact. And there's there's a quote um, from your uh, book, and you speak about. Um, well, Spain. So it says, like the Moorish Muslim, Muslim presence in Spain, Portugal, and Italy, it is almost never mentioned as part of the region's official or popular historical narrative. Narrative, the long anti-religious period of communism that followed Fermo's now faded footstep is partly to blame for this. Um, I mean, my, one of my questions when, when reading that is, so what do you think can be done to, to challenge um, what I think many of us would see like the erasure of, of, of Islamic heritage? I think the erasure of Islamic heritage is the tougher question. Mm -hmm. The acknowledgement is probably slightly easier for me to under, um, um, explain, sorry, appreciate. Mm -hmm. And that goes hand in hand with potentially stopping any erasure, whether that's Islamic heritage or other heritages in a mm -hmm. space. It's about those who are in charge of the authorized narratives of places, whether that's the historical institutes, whether that's the historical societies, Obviously, they have a big role to play. For example, here in the UK, we have National Trust, we have English Heritage. You know, if these institutes don't step up and start to acknowledge the more diverse um, British cultural narratives, then those spaces don't get protected, they get overlooked, they get ignored, they don't get acknowledged. And it's easier for those who want to dismiss those narratives to then, as you say, erase them. And this has happened across Europe for, for various reasons, because historically, um, the, the kind of, um, you know, the, the forces that, that came out on top during wars, for example, whether it's the most recent ethno-religious wars that I talk about in the Balkans or, or, the, or the historic religious wars, obviously, the winners tend to write the histories in these spaces. And it's the same, just so listeners can put this into perspective and, and not see this as a kind of, um, you know, anti-Islamic thing. The same has happened in the Middle East. You know, I spent ages writing guidebooks um, in the Middle East, and I struggled to find the histories that have been erased of historic Christian and Jewish communities there. So it's not just about, you know, something against Islam. It's about... Um, the, the 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 countries the the places and the spaces being much more transparent about their history and being willing to to embrace it even if it's not comfortable it's their heritage you know even if it's not something they're totally at ease with it's essentially this this reality that when somebody writes the history when somebody puts together the narrative of a space and in the, okay so let's let's talk about 
the Balkan example because clearly that's in the book. And as I've just alluded to, in areas where Muslim um, people have been more dominant, you know, you just have to flip it around. So if we take the Balkan example, where Muslims obviously were dominant for a long time, but then weren't, what then happens is a narrative begins to develop, obviously, that is created in direct opposition to the Muslim narrative. And so that begins to start to affect the way people look at their own um, cult, um, historic and cultural narrative, and also the way they look at the Islamic narrative in their own space. And often, if that is seen as the enemy, if that is seen as the, as the kind of people who oppress them, then they want to do away with that. All of us do. If we feel like something's oppressing us, if we feel like something's, um, you know, caused us harm, then we don't really want to remember it. And so what happens is, in, in, in places like the Balkans, there's this very kind of interesting relationship between um, the Muslim heritage in the area and the memory of the Ottomans. Because the reality is, the Ottomans are the reason that Islam came to the Balkans especially. Although there is some evidence that Islam was there before the Ottomans in, in little corners. But the way in which it affected the entire region was, of course, to do with a, um, you know, the Ottoman Empire arriving. Now, obviously, the Ottoman, the Ottomans being colonialists, um, the Ottomans being um, imperialists, um, inevitably, you know, committed a lot of atrocities in this area and did oppress and did occupy and so on. The fact that they gave Islam to a lot of people or brought Islam in then becomes a memory that is caught up with the colonial memory. And so while I was on the ground out there in places, you know, um, just, just for your listeners, I went from Bosnia to Serbia to um, Kosovo to North Macedonia, Albania and Montenegro. And as I said earlier, three of those countries statistically have a Muslim majority population. But even in those countries, not everyone was always as comfortable with their Muslim heritage because it was wrapped up um, in the idea of an occupier. And, and that, that is what can make it problematic. And obviously, whoever's writing the narratives, and in the case of um, these countries, most recently, um, it was a communist um, government and, and dictatorship in some cases that wanted to write the government, I mean, sorry, wanted to write the, the histories. And so a lot of it was erased. And then in the case of um, later on in the fall of the actual communist government, we have the rise of ethno-religious um, sort of tensions um, and certain institutes and um, certain governments um, in, in, in the fall of country, um, in the fall of things like Yugoslavia were trying to develop an identity that was based on the opposite to the Ottoman presence. And the opposite to the Ottoman presence often meant the opposite to a Muslim identity. And that's why it's quite a conflicted space and people aren't always comfortable with talking about the area's Muslim heritage as easily as some people might assume. Fantastic. Oh, thank you so no much. So we were, I, I know I, I just asked you a question about um just looking at obviously the, the erasure of, of like not necessarily just Islamic heritage, I guess any heritage. And obviously yeah. you talk a lot about that actually, you know, throughout the book. And and actually one thing that I think really moved me, and it's because to me obviously I was quite ignorant of it. Um you spoke a little bit about um a particular bridge. So I'm just gonna find Is it Stop Mehmet Pasha oh, right, yeah. bridge. It was is it Mostar Stari Most? Oh yeah, there's two, two bridges that, that yeah, two bridges that are significant. There's Stari Most which is in Mosul, the one that goes, you know, that ends up now really, really um, positively ends up on a, in a lot of travel literature yes. now. because It's very, very iconic. It's the Apex Bridge. Yes, the Starry Mosque, it's called. 
Yes, Thari Moss. So um, again, one of the quotes, you know, you, you just speak about, um, you know, the targeted destruction of Mostar's Thari Moss or Old Bridge was probably one of the most successful examples of cultural genocide inflicted on Bosnia's Muslim heritage during the Bosnian War. Um, you know, and, and to me, so I, I did actually go in and I Googled it. And like you said, I was really, um, well, I guess surprised because like you said, there was uh, one particular video on, on YouTube. Um, it was looking at how it looks modern day and how actually there's it, it's a massive tourist area. But then also the fact that, you know, it took so many years to, to restore. And I think partly, you know, one of my questions was that what can communities do in that situation, which obviously, you know, we can't even, I guess, even even begin to imagine, but to take to stay connected to the heritage, even though those very buildings, you know, might have been destroyed and are still being restored. I, I think um, the Starry Mosque is quite an interesting example. Obviously, <clears throat> in the midst of a war, it's very difficult for the local population to try and protect anything. They're more concerned about surviving. Um, but what happened post-war is probably a wonderful example of, you know, of a community and a culture rising from the flames like a phoenix. Um, you know, um, I talk about in the book, there's this um, local archi architect um, who decides that, does, you know, he was, he was very fortunate. He was living out in the U.S. He was lecturing in universities. Um, you know, and he decided, no, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to have this. I'm not going to let them take away this iconic symbol, this this huge, huge, significant monument to the very identity of Mostar as a um, city. You know, the, Mostar means bridge, you know, mm -hmm. Starry Most. It comes the name comes from that bridge, as far as I'm aware. Um, but this is just this is not just any old bridge. This is a bridge built by one of the greatest Ottoman sultans, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. It was um, it was designed. I mean, sorry, it was constructed by a student of one of the great architects, Mimar Sinan. So it's got all of that as well as the fact that you know the bridge symbolised many things for locals. It symbolised the marriage of of the different cultures, the the coexistence, the the interfaith. And so he he decided that he would campaign. Um, he was he was in a privileged position. He was a scholar at Harvard, I think. Um, and you know he he managed to go around and as he spoke, he raised awareness of the fact that the bridge was gone. And he he spoke as though you know the bridge was going to be rebuilt. He even set a time and a date when it was going to be opened. And on his flyer, he he reimagined what it would look like when it was going to be built and so on. And his is a wonderfully romantic story because of the fact that, you know, people like UNESCO jumped on board and other countries around the globe and even, even the countries that quote unquote might be to blame like Croatia and that eventually recognized what a hor horrific thing it was and jumped on board. And we, we have this wonderful story of it being rebuilt stone for stone, almost, you know, um, architects, um, um, and engineers who knew the classical Ottoman way of building bridges were brought in. And many people actually um, didn't even know that it's a rebuilt version. It's, it's been done so well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people assume it's the original. And it's only when they look into the story behind it, they realize that. And I'm sure the first time I encountered it, I wasn't aware until I started doing my research as well. So these, these are the narratives mm -hmm. that get forgotten, as you say, because of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, yeah, and I think, like you said, it's one of those things that, unless we don't know, and that's why your book, I think, is so crucial, um, the Minarets and Mountains, just exploring um, that heritage and, and the stories behind it, which is actually sometimes the stories that, that get lost, you know, so even though that, you know, that, that physical, um, you know, there's something physical to see, you won't necessarily know unless you kind of delve a bit deeper. Um, so, I mean, I know we are, we're approaching, um, the uh, first uh, break uh, very, very soon. Um, but just before we do that, maybe just um, a minute to, to kind of sum up what has the journey been like for you in terms of writing, you know, th this book in particular? Um, it's been an interesting journey. When, it, when it's your first narrative book, um, some of your listeners will know I've been writing for Lonely Planet for a while. So I've published guidebooks from different countries, but this is a very different project altogether. You know, this is my book and my book alone. It's mm. it's my first one. That's a travel narrative. That's not, you know, not a guidebook. It's telling a story, as you've said. Mm. 
and to try and get published for the first time with something like that, when you're doing something very, very different to what the industry is used to, one, you're writing about a, a, a history and a heritage that hasn't really been explored and therefore isn't really out there. Two, you're writing it as someone who's not a classical travel writer. You know, I'm not a white middle class, middle aged guy, so to speak. Um, three, I was, you know, I was featuring my family in it, something else you don't get in there. So there's lots of things that were breaking convention. So it was really quite challenging. And at times, having having originally drafted the book as soon as I arrived in 2016, um, at times I did lose hope and faith and the book nearly did not get written. It was in, in a bizarre way, um, the pandemic happening um, almost was, you know, very, very helpful for me concerning the book. I know it's been an awful thing. Um, and so I was able to spend that time really polishing it, finding myself an agent and, and then my agent finding a deal, which all of which in itself is a minor miracle, given, you know, um, the fact that we were in a pandemic and nobody really wanted to spend that money. But it was interesting re revisiting some of those places, revisiting some of my own memories were quite traumatic, you know, of what happened to me as a child um, regarding racism and then later with Islamophobia. And then going back to those places obviously was wonderful as well at, through the actual um, writing process. Yeah, no, I mean, that's wonderful to hear. And I think those different elements in your book is what made it so relatable. I mean, definitely for me, you know, reading about not only the stories and the heritage, but the fact that you were traveling as a family, which was really lovely as well. Um, so we are heading to um, the break. Grab yourselves a cup of tea and some biscuits, and we'll be back with you in a few moments. So, assalamu alaikum. Asalaamu Alaikum, this is Atif Nawaz. Listen to Inspire FM shows in your time by heading over to inspirefm.org or listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Assalamu Alaikum and welcome back to the Book Club show on Inspire. And we are talking today about Minarets in the Mountains, a journey into Muslim Europe. And we are joined in the studio by author of the book, um, Dariq Hussain. Just before uh, the break, we were talking about, um, well, basically travel, um, the way heritage has been to some extent relegated to the past but the importance of actually um rekindling that interest and that love and just having um, lots to learn especially when it comes to um i think muslim europe as has been coined um about this book in particular um now um Derek, thank you so much obviously for joining us um today um there is quite early on in the book you obviously and you spoke just before the break as well the fact that you were traveling um as a family which is so lovely to hear um and there's a there's a part where you talking about living slowly um and you say we were a family of londoners constantly playing catch up with time where every day was an attempt to juggle work with after school clubs and child minders forever spinning um i'm sure there's lots of families who can uh, relate to relate to those feelings um do you think you know slightly maybe unrelated to the book but in terms of travel just generally as well has the pandemic um, been a good opportunity for, for people to, to live slowly, or do you think maybe it's had the opposite effect? Oh, without a shadow of a doubt, we haven't had a choice, have we, really? When all your usual avenues for sort of, dis from work through to distraction, shall we say, you know, be that um, for leisurely activities, um, to go out and eat, to watch films, whatever you want to call them, when they're all shut off and, and you have no choice, but to go into yourselves and find other ways to sort of live our extremely hectic lives. Yes, without a shadow of a doubt, I think a lot of people have probably learned or had to live slower, but that's not through choice. You know, the people that we were staying with in, in Bulgaria were part of a movement. Um, um, uh, I think it's a worldwide movement about living slowly, about unplugging, taking yourself off the grid, which is, which is very, very appealing to me because I do think, you know, the modern world with its kind of all invasive social mediums and, and with the internet and constantly being plugged in and switched on through the devices that we hold in our hands, it can be quite stressful and overwhelming and and very angst inducing for a lot of people 
And I think, you know, to be able to unplug and to be able to do that is actually very, very refreshing and good for the soul as well. Mm. Yes, definitely. And you're right, of course, it hasn't been um, out of choice, but definitely, I think even when it comes to myself or, or, or family, um, I mean, taking Ramadan as an example, the first lockdown, and actually how it felt like a huge blessing, just not having those external pressures and, and being able to enjoy what, you know, the time that we did have. Um, and even, uh, for example, I know you just mentioned this idea of, of kind of the, the impact of social media. Uh, again, as part of the book, um, there's a quote where you say, people hardly spoke, and if they did, it was brief and whispered. Despite the obvious photogenic nature of the space, few people were obsessing over taking any. When they did, it was done respecting the fact that this was an active place of worship, where prayer mats were left out facing Makkah, um, for those that wanted to pause, reflect, and remember. Um, so. I guess my question really was that, you know, it's something I've noticed, uh, you know, I was quite young when we first went to Umrah, for example, and I remember, you know, not being allowed cameras at the time, and obviously that those things have changed, and, and just generally when we're going to visit sacred places, but do you think social media has, not what kind of impact has that had? Yeah, I think it's a twofold impact, you know. Um... Unfortunately, it's like what we say, um, you know, a, a, a double-edged sword, shall we say. You know, the social medium means, of course, that many of us who can't travel, we've noticed this through through the pandemic in particular, social medium has allowed us to kind of, you know, um, float off to places and, and imagine ourselves in places where people might be streaming live because they live locally or recently did take lots of pictures and then decided to share them. So there's that wonderful positive of being able to go to places that you can't visit yourself because nowadays with these devices, they're so powerful and they're so good at capturing a place. And then the flip side, of course, is often people get so caught up in trying to either record a space or try to share that space with their um, wider followers or whatever, especially if they're kind of a big, big Instagrammer or, or or they have a lot of following on other other mediums that they maybe sometimes overlook why they're there and the one and the the paragraph that you read was um in in the techie in Blagai which is still a functioning Sufi lodge obviously when we're visiting as tourists it's not functioning in that moment mm -hmm. um but yeah it's often quite sad if you go to a spiritually significant space and as somebody who's who did the last um, pre-pandemic Hajj, I remember feeling that way myself, but also sometimes getting caught up in it myself as well. You know, I don't know, going to Arafat and being like, wow, I oh my God, look at this space. I, I want to show everyone what's going on here or, or remember it myself. And you start recording and then you, look, then you, then you feel a little bit guilty because you're like, well, should I be doing that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, yes. And, and I think also you have to be conscious of how other people want to try and enjoy that space and be respectful that even if you wish to record it maybe now is not the right time maybe wait until there's a more appropriate time and i think some of that etiquette and some of that respect for sacred spaces muslim or otherwise are often completely overlooked mm. yes definitely and i think um it is about, yeah, it just maybe does come back to that individual person, just being mindful. Um, and like you said, that there's always, um, I guess, the right time to do things and, and yeah, not being necessarily overwhelmed with always having to share. And, and you're right, I think we all fall into that trap. And and I think it is it's part of the challenge of, um, of having this technology, whereas obviously it wasn't the case, you know, um, for those of us who might be a little bit, <laughs> a little bit older. Um, so in terms of uh, another part of the book, and um, again, I'm sure this is quite relatable for, for some of our listeners. Um, you say, where before I was told I didn't belong here because I was a Paki. Now I was told I didn't belong here because I was a Muslim. And it wasn't just Britain telling me this. It seemed as though the entire Western world wanted me and my kind out. Um, so I think what struck me was the fact that, you know, many of us would have you know, witnessed that transition, you know, to, into a post 9-11 world. How do you think um, traveling or can traveling um, help challenge that kind of racism and Islamophobia? Um, and if so, in what way? Yeah, I think traveling certainly does help to challenge it. Um, but of course, you're not taking the kind of um people who inflict 
this mm -hmm. this racism and prejudice with you and so really it's for me a lot of those people need to travel and experience the world beyond their own doorstep um because most of that comes from and i did a reflection recently where i tried to try to talk about that most of that um racism and prejudice comes from a fear of the other a fear of difference a fear of the foreign a fear of something that is not familiar and so one of the one of the wonderful side effects um not side effects one of, one of the wonderful positives of travel when it's done properly is of course to embrace the other learn about the foreign and and understand it um in a way that you can't from books even, from watching things on the telly or watching things on, on social media or whatever. So travel, I think, has that powerful transformative effect of one, introducing you to the foreign and the other, but more importantly, making you comfortable being somewhere foreign, somewhere, somewhere other, and not always in your own comfort zone. So I think it has that transformative effect for sure. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, it does, you know, the number of times maybe that, you know, I've, I've traveled with, you know, mostly with family and I think taking young children as well, it's, it's sometimes about making space, isn't it? Because whereas we, we are always viewed as the other, um, by making space, perhaps that, you know, that is, you know, in, in and of itself, you know, challenging whatever the narrative um, is out there, which I think is quite, it's quite interesting. Um, now, you, you mentioned this idea of, of, you know, foreignness and, and the other. Um, you also mentioned in the book that, you know, uh, and again, I'm quoting, this intimate tolerance of each other's beliefs let me gen left me genuinely moved. I'd never come across anything like it in, before in Europe. Um, so I guess I was just maybe interrogating a little bit this idea that, you know, tolerance obviously is really it's it's good to have especially you know when, when you're um in a multicultural multi-faith you know society but actually you know what needs to be done to then aspire for a more accepting society because you know in some ways tolerance is is maybe at a quite base level um you're, you're right i mean tolerance is is just basically saying yeah i'm putting up with you and in hindsight mm -hmm. i might have rewritten that as acceptance but i think um <clears throat> my use of intimate was trying to allude to that because actually it's not what what was happening in that particular example in in a in a small um little techie um in the bulgarian countryside was they'd actually agreed to share the space which is highly highly unusual and i've not seen that um in too, too often i have actually seen it in other places since um, most recently in in thailand where i saw um local buddhist cultures um, and, and the local Muslims had agreed to share the tomb of a long forgotten Muslim sultan. Um, mm. And that's about, um, you know, that's about coming to an agreement and accepting that that can be done. Let's be, mm. let's be very, very honest here. Um, many people's positions on their own religious um, kind of um, way of looking at things means that they won't accept other religious um, iconography or other religious um you know um presence within their own spaces so it's quite tough if people have a, quite a rigid take on whether or not a space should be exclusively theirs so that can be tough in in terms of religious spaces but generally outside of those spaces in those communities in those cultures i think sometimes history gets depicted as being quite black and white whereas when you look back be it in the balkans be it in in um in britain here or in you know in in the subcontinent that my parents are originally from what i've read shows that people have historically quite fluidly existed next to each other except when somebody has come along and and presented some kind of reason to 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 dislike the other or 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 decide to push the other out in the case of if i go to my um you know ethnic roots and um, cultural roots in bangladesh for example before partition we know that you know hindus and muslims lived in relative peace and harmony even under the british raj obviously before that even more so but then mm. during partition it became it was horrific it was a bloodbath and all these all these Muslims who were in India got displaced and had to move across the border into what was now East, pa um, East Pakistan as the Muslim land, you know, and, and all those Hindus that were in what was there and what became East Pakistan had to be shuffled across to India and find new homes. And it's just a tragedy and a, and a travesty. And, and, and I think it's about learning that 
within our own faiths, if we look at our, all, all the big faiths of the world, mm. all of them actually ask you to respect the other. All of them actually ask you to, um, you know, um, accept mm. that people are going to have different faiths and i think it's it's the individual that sometimes has trouble with that or or the clerics that try to push towards exclusivity as a muslim for example we know there are loads of verses about you know god creating us as different tribes and we should get to know them and and that people aren't going to accept the faith you know you you're on your dean and i'm on mine you know there's lots of this stuff in there that mm -hmm. says we're not all going to be muslims so stop trying to convert everybody accept people for who they are and and yeah. and learn to get along because that's how the world was created and we know that yeah absolutely and i think that's just it this this idea of of accepting others is always i mean any person of any faith really it's it's kind of an inherent part of that um so you're right it does kind of get a little bit uh the whole yeah i guess concept gets diluted <clears throat> especially when it comes to politics and, and that kind of political gain um so in terms of coming back to this obviously the fact that you know minarets in the mountains um in essence is i mean like we said it's not a travel guide but that you know travel is the is the kind of main um uh, um, one of the outcomes, I guess, from, from wanting to discover, you know, different stories. Um, you and I really loved when I read a little bit about um, this idea that you travelled to a place and um, they were refusing payment, you know, from you because you were travellers and that kind of honour um, placed on on travellers. Because again, you know, as part of the Muslim faith, we know that you know the the Dwarva traveller is accepted, for example. Um, so, do you think, that, however, that um, the notion of traveling or being a traveler nowadays has become a bit too commercialized yeah i yeah without a shadow of a doubt um this is to do with and i'm i'm obviously somebody who benefits from this so i can't be too critical mm -hmm. but the the, sure. the fact that travel ha has become so much cheaper in my lifetime alone um has played a mm -hmm. massive part you know um the budget airlines um, mm. the, the fact that people can now, people have such a diverse range of options for, for accommodation. You know, you can go from high end all the way through to sleeping free on someone's couch. There are many, many ways to move around the planet now that mean that you don't have to break the bank. And this has meant that anybody and everybody, until the pandemic, of course, could travel very, very easily, assuming you were from one of those countries that had a, had a pa passport that allowed you to. Obviously, it's a different discussion for those who live in countries where their passports very rarely get recognized mm -hmm. outside of their own um but to come back to your point about has it become too commercialized yes uh, um uh, of course it's become very commercialized um you know the rise of instagram the rise of um influencers travel influencers mean that travel has become very commercialized it's become a commodity and increasingly it's it's about you know selling a place or or selling um a, a particular um product in that place and and that's become an underlying kind of part of many people's um presence in the travel industry and um, i on the other hand of course I'm, I'm traveling because i want to tell stories and and of course the kind of book i've written in in the literary world is known as armchair travel so yes i it, it's not a guidebook because you're not supposed to carry it around and find things as you say but you're supposed to be taken on a journey in your armchair mm -hmm. with the book and and of course that's what people do with it but often mm -hmm. i do this with books like that i then take them to the places that i might want to visit because i also find it quite magical to read someone else's experience in a in a more detailed way when i'm there in the actual space and obviously i do that with the traveler Elia Chelebi the Ottoman traveller, because I, mm -hmm. I refer to his travel log and what he wrote when he was in a lot of those places mm -hmm. to draw those comparisons. So the travel of Evliya Chelebi's time and the travel of today is vastly different, you know. This was a time when it would take months to get anywhere. Today, um, you know, pre-pandemic, we could just walk up to, to an airport, jump on a plane and be somewhere very exotic mm -hmm. and different within a couple of hours. So, yeah, mm -hmm. the ease of travel has certainly helped to commercialize it. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and I echo, I think, your sentiment, and, and it was really lovely reading Minarets of the Mountains, because it was um, obviously following your journey, but then the journeys of, of others, you know, and other, I, I guess, journals and, and things that have been documented, which is, which is really amazing just to be able to um, 
and kind of yeah live live through that i think i mean on the on the idea of actually traveling and what you just spoke of obviously because of the pandemic and and generally there might be reasons you know p- people aren't able to travel what you know maybe other than obviously reading your book which i would highly recommend what what other ways that you know people can maybe increase their knowledge of you know culture and heritage if, if they aren't able to travel do you think well, I think you know the obvious, obvious, um, obvious thing there is to read more. Mm. Um, I think we're we're a we're a generation um, that don't read enough anymore. We scan mm. everything, you know. And what I mean by that is even an article on our phones, we scan read because mm. we're we're very much a a kind of we're living in an age where um, it's always about the next thing. What's the next thing? What's the next thing? What what's going to engage me today you know and in a day we probably have access to more information than most people would in a century in the past Mm -hmm. you know when you think about how information was distributed even i don't know a hundred years ago to what we get access to through our phones in an instant now it's night and day and i think Mm -hmm. coming back to your idea of slow living you know reading is is something that forces you to live slowly you know the idea of sitting there with a book in your hand in an armchair a lot of my my friends who i'm not going to name because i don't want to shame them or whatever um you know they're like i I don't read books but i bought your book because you wrote it and now i'm going to try and read it and then they're being very honest and saying my god you know you really need to set aside time to do this and it's like yes it's a book you know and many of them their their idea of reading might be i don't know sitting on a bus and scanning through a, a an article on the news or something you know that's that's reading yeah. to them whereas um histor- yes. like m- normally reading is you know you, you know you're going to do this for an hour yes. and then you have to you have to ring fence that time and you have to sit with it and that's also how we really absorb a place mm-hmm. as well. i mean a place as well it's also how we absorb the historicity it's also how we learn properly and i think a lot of people have lost that we 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 kind of focus on sound bites and headlines and mm-hmm. and yesterday when my guardian article came out I, I got a lot of sort of really snide and nasty remarks and some as i've alluded mm-hmm. to earlier some vitriolic private messages and it was so obvious that they'd only read the headline they mm-hmm. hadn't even bothered to establish that this was an extract of mm-hmm. a book and that there is much more in the book so i do tell a much wider story they they just sort of read the headline didn't like what it was saying and went for it you know yeah. so yeah reading is my big thing obviously as an author i'm going to say that yeah of course no no and i i completely 100 percent um support you on that and i think it is because reading it does require um, you know uh, um, investment and it's kind of a good investment definitely and and i know publishing um twitter recently has been in an absolute <laughs> shambles um, over a certain book and and actually uh, you know like you're saying that people just look at the headline and they take just read things at face value without you know actually um you know i guess like i'm saying you know invest the time to really um you know discover things and, and have an opportunity to to learn and make change um and we are approaching now the, near the end of um the show and i guess there are a couple of things um firstly where obviously can people um buy um a copy of minarets in the mountains um and also what kind of legacy are you hoping that your book will create because there's a part of it where um you speak about you know, keeping a journal of, of, of travels. Um, so yeah, so th- just two things there. What legacy you hope your book will create and where can people buy your book? So the book is available anywhere and everywhere now. Um, it's it's now being distributed worldwide as well. But for UK listeners, whether it's your local WH Smith or whether it's the mm-hmm. usual places online, you know who they are. I don't want to name the big yeah. ones, but I think it's obvious no, to everyone. Sure. Well, all the all all book um, all major book stockists now sell the book, so that's great. Even you can even go and buy it off the Guardian if you want. Um, as for the legacy, I think my greatest legacy if if there is to be one would be to be able to normalize um at least or 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 start at least a discussion towards normalizing the idea that there is a indigenous muslim europe which which a lot of people seem to have a bit of an issue with and what i mean by that is you know people who are indigenous to Europe who are Muslim, you know, whether that's somebody who's ethnically Albanian, therefore indigenous, ethnically Bosnian, therefore indigenous to Europe, and happens to be Muslim. That's, that's kind of, you know, that would be an amazing discussion to be able to start and eventually move towards normalizing this idea that, you know, 
Europe's cultural narrative and, and cultural legacy is as Muslim as it is Christian, Judaic, and, you know, even pagan, or uh, and all the others in between. Yeah, that's right. And obviously, the, the his, history is so rich, I think, you know, if we're, if we're willing to, to read about it, and even, I guess, within the British context as well, because, you know, Islam is, is seen as something foreign to this country, even though actually, you know, the presence um, has been here, you know, for, for over 100 years, you know, so how do you think, um, you know, maybe just to sum up in, in the British context, can, can this book, you know, apply or in terms of heritage for, for our country? In, in, yeah, so obviously as a Brit, I can talk about it from a first-hand experience, you know, mm -hmm. I think we are, um, as British Muslims, wh whatever your kind of um, historic cultural um, um, roots, and, and for some people there are none because they're converts to Islam and they're through and through English or whatever, um, we, we have a multi multiplicity of identities and, and, and places we can look towards for anchoring those identities. And in the same way, many Muslims in the UK will look towards the East, as in whether that's, you know, all the way to places like Saudi Arabia or even to places like India, Pakistan and Bangladesh for their mm -hmm. kind of Muslim identities and, and cult, um, understanding of what it means to be a Muslim. I think, you know, we as Muslims of the West and Europe should recognize that we have um, a similar, uh, um, we, we, sorry, we have identities and, and cultural legacies right here on this continent. And some will argue they're more comfortable with being on this continent if you look at the historicity because they've always been European and Muslim at the same time. And so there's, a, I think there's a lot to be learned from, you know, um, the, the Bosnian example, the Albanian, the Kosovan example. And in exploring it, we're, we're not going to be comfortable with everything. I'm sure you recall, Imrana, from reading the book, I, I had to admit to myself and my family that sometimes some of the things we came across were very foreign to us and very different to us, as well as stuff we came across that we really loved. You know, we loved the fact that we, we were talking to to, to a guide, for example, whose, grand, um, whose great great grandfather on, on his mum's side had rescued one of the most important and significant Jewish um, um, relics um, of Eastern Europe, the, the, um, the Sarajevo Haggadah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, to learn these kind of legacies, to learn about the way in which Muslims had protected Jews for 12 mm -hmm. centuries in Europe. You can see there are clearly lots of things we can take from this heritage that we can be proud of and we can we can then begin to embody, you know, and 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 it, it become much more wholesome as as individuals ourselves over here in Europe. Definitely. And there's absolutely so much actually to, to celebrate. And, and that's why Minarets in the Mountains, A Journey into Muslim Europe is such a, um, a key book, I think, you know, for, for people to read. So thank you so much uh, for your time this morning, um, Tariq. We are now heading to the end of the show. I will see you in a couple of weeks. So assalamu alaikum. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Why not tune in to our live stream at inspirefm.org? And follow and subscribe to our social media platforms at InspireFM Luton.